evening, everybody. Let me have your attention. We'll go ahead and get started. We're so glad that you are with us here tonight. Uh, we are excited to get to continue our series. Uh, Richard and Pam uh, did a great job last week sharing their story with us. Tonight we get to hear from Brooks and Marianne Loveless. Uh, been longtime members here at Broadway, have been a part of Lubbock and this community and this Broadway family for a long time. And so many of you know them, uh, but you may not know a whole lot about them. And so this will be an opportunity to get to hear some of their stories. Some of you don't know them at all, and so it'll be a treat for you to get to hear um, uh, from them tonight. So let me open us with a word of prayer, and then I'll turn it over. Father, we are thankful for your grace and the way that you work in our lives. Uh, Lord, you provide so much, uh, things that we take for granted, uh, the air that we breathe, uh, the way that our bodies uh, derive nutrients from different foods that we enjoy eating. God, you just are so creative and thoughtful, and uh, we are thankful. But God, you also provide not only for us physically, but for us emotionally and spiritually and relationally. And tonight we get a chance to hear uh, from, from Brooks and, and Marianne and hear uh, their story of faith and, and, and how they have become a part of our family here at Broadway, but also uh, the work that you have been doing in and through them. Uh, Father, we are thankful for uh, our friendship with them. We, uh, we give you thanks for them. ask for your blessing tonight as we hear uh, their story. Uh, God, we ask this prayer in, in the name of Christ. Amen. I'm surprised anybody showed up. Um, oh, by the way, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Brooks. Happy birthday to you. September 7th, 1953, um, my mom was in labor <laughs> the whole day, okay, um, for like 17 hours or something like that, and I was born at five minutes until midnight, and uh, it was Labor Day <laughs> in more ways than one. So that's what I heard about from her. Um, my parents were both born in, the, in Dallas County in a little town um, that's been swallowed up by the Dallas growth long ago. Um, but um, they knew each other growing up, and, and so they... She was two years younger. He had finished college at SMU. Um, he tried to play football there, but he was a freshman, and on one play, took out ACLs of both his knees. Um, they didn't have such good medical stuff back then, and he told me that he, every once a week he had to have his knees drained for two years. He was on crutches for all that time. Um, but he... Uh, he was a mechanical engineer by education. He went to work for Texas Power and Light Company, moved off to Trinidad, Texas, which is somewhere in East Texas. Um, she was at Abilene Christian. She was the only child. Um, you know, that was their, her parents' dream was to have her graduate from Abilene Christian and that kind of thing. But um, she got kind of tired of going to school and he was working already. And, they decided to elope. Uh, they didn't want to tell anybody, and so they didn't want to get their, whatever you call it, your marriage license or whatever it is in Dallas County, because it might be in the paper. <laughs> so they, they went off to a county east of Dallas, Kaufman, and um, went to the courthouse, and the lady that was helping them there, the clerk, they said, uh, we really don't know anybody in this county, but we also, you know, are wondering if there's anybody here that might be able to 
be the preacher for our wedding. She said, uh, well, what kind of church do you go to? And they, t- she, they told her, and she said, oh, well, my husband's a preacher for the Church of Christ here in Kaufman. They said, well, okay, that'd be good. So they showed up with a couple of friends, you know, later and got married there. And then they had the great idea for just keep it a secret, so she went back to Abilene. <laughs> what kind of dumb plan is that? And, uh, that didn't last very long, you know, about 10 days or two weeks or something like that. After that, she called him up and said, come get me, and that's the end of that ruse. Um, so there was some tension there, as you might imagine, between my dad and her parents for a little while until that eventually wore off. Um, so uh, I grew up in Garland initially um, through fifth grade, and then he got a promotion, and we moved to Sherman, and he got another promotion after about five years, and we moved to Waco, and I graduated from high school in Waco, at Waco Richfield High School, which doesn't exist anymore. They, well, they reduced the number of high schools in Waco so they would each be more competitive size-wise with other high schools in the region. And so my high school's still there, but they call it Lubbock, uh, Waco High now. Anyway, um, and I went to college at the University of Texas in Austin. My brother was already there, and he had a car. That was a main contributing factor there, but I'd always, I guess, liked it, but wanted to go there. But um, And that's where I started going to the uh, university class there, University Avenue Church. And um, there's, I met Mark Thompson there and Celeste way back. Um, but that's where I began to hear, you know, some really good teachers there. Um, James Thompson was the most memorable one, one to me. And um, so it wasn't like I didn't know some stuff. Uh, my dad was a sometimes preacher. Um, on the weekends. He had been a, um, uh, an assistant, I guess, to a guy back in the day. Some of you people will remember this uh, uh, period in the Church of Christ history where we really enjoyed debates and debating each other and arguing back and forth about what was what. And why my, my thinking is right and yours wrong all that kind of thing. Well, there was a guy in the, in the North Texas area that was pretty well known in that, and uh, my dad was an uh, assistant of his, I guess, for a few years. His, his name, that man's name was Flavel Colley. I don't know if anybody here probably never heard of that guy, but anyway, uh, that was real important to my dad, was all those things he learned while he was doing that. And he preached for a while in little churches that had a vacancy or something and need somebody to fill in, so Sometimes we'd be driving out in the country down dirt roads and, uh, to go to those churches, and that was fun. Um, I think it was in about fifth or sixth grade in Sunday school that we really started getting into um, not just the Gospels, but getting into the book of Acts and Romans and uh, some of those books that it really started, I started cluing in to how important all this was. And that's when I uh, started thinking about being serious about, about that as much as you can when you're, you know, 12 years old. But um, we lived in Sherman and we went to Wood Street Church of Christ there, and that's where I was baptized. Uh, my dad baptized me there and uh, that's where that started Um, so mm, got to college started learning more and that was pretty pretty good and pretty important Uh, I changed majors just once in college um, from biology to accounting and that was a good move on my part. I'd really like biology, but for some reason, for all the careers that you might 
and joy in biology, they seem to think you should take chemistry. <laughs> and I didn't really think that was so great for me. Um, organic chemistry was not much fun. Um, but I decided to try business courses one semester and it just all made sense to me, so that's, that's kind of what I did. Um, I went to Dallas for my first job. I had a, a job with a, a small public accounting firm and uh, it was just me and, and the guy that hired me. We were the only people there. And um, so I was learning a lot. We had a lot of small clients and that was a lot of fun for me. Uh, talking to businessmen that were just starting their businesses from the first day. I need an accounting system of some sort. And all of this is before you know, PCs and computers and stuff and everything was done on paper with pencils and calculators. But we had a pretty good system set up for doing that kind of work. And so I got to meet a lot of these new clients and talk about their fresh new businesses and how excited they were. And um, it was a lot of fun to have that perspective of it. Except for there was, there was one guy that every year he'd bring his tax return information in, you know, in a box, in like a shoe box. And all he did was take all his receipts for the year and throw them in that box. And, you know, I'd bring it to me at the end of the year. That's sort of what it seemed like. And I would explain to him at the end when I gave him his nice organized tax return, next year, you know, this is the way I'll do it. It's like this. It wouldn't take very long, and it, but it never changed. You get the same old thing. <laughs> yeah, laughing. <laughs> Who's that? Is that okay. not Sir? Is that not normal? Uh, that, that wasn't normal there, but he, he, he was ab abnormal. He's asking about it now. That's what he does. Oh, okay. Well, there, that's normal to have a certain percentage of people that are that way. That's true. <laughs> uh, at any rate, um, while I was working there, uh, we, just, we were growing a little bit, and we hired another accountant uh, as well. And... Um, we had a computer, not a PC, but one of these big ones, you know, it like, takes up a small room. And uh, it was an IBM System 32. And we needed somebody to kind of do key punching of data on that deal. And so put an ad in the paper. You want to tell, oh, you came to be this part? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Kaylee thinks this is great. Um, Mary Ann uh, McGinnis uh, decided that summer to go spend some time with her older sister and her sister's family in Plano. Uh, she, so she went from Pittsburgh and she hadn't traveled much. That's a big long trip and uh, big change of scenery and all that. And uh, so she moved there, and, and um, so they felt obligated to entertain her uh, on weekends, et cetera. And um, so they would take her with them, and they would go bar hopping in the Dallas area. Okay, should I take the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> well done. But I'm from Pennsylvania originally. And if I did go bar hopping, it's because my family is Catholic. So Catholics, we, well, drink. So um, anyway, I took this job at the CPA firm, met Brooks, and um, started going to church with him. And I remember, and where is, um, oh, I can't think of his name. I'm all fine here in the room. There he is, Rod. I think I told you this story. Um, that he, we went to Austin to visit a friend of his and went to church there first time for me and when I we left I said 
Brooks, that was the most beautiful organ music I have ever heard. <laughs> and he said, what? And I said, that music, that was just gorgeous. The angels were singing. And he said, we don't have an organ. I said, yes, you do. There was an organ in there. That was an organ. There was no way, there was no way that anybody could sing like that. He had to take me back in and show me. What was the name of the church? University, University Avenue. Had to go down there and show me there was no organ on the Good job. <laughs> so, um, she was working for the firm, and uh, she was, she's like six years younger than me, and so it, she wasn't somebody that I thought, oh, that's somebody I should, should think about dating or whatever, but um, she was funny, and she was, uh, uh, she, one day at the office, <laughs> she, um, my boss was doing work at his desk, and he said, he said, Marianne, uh, can you come in here for a minute? She came in there and he said, um, would you go get me some, would you go get me some rubber bands from the storeroom? And she said, what? And he said, go get me some rubber bands. <laughs> no. I was 18. He, he looked up from his papers, which he'd been working over. This is the first time he'd looked up and he looked up at it and said, why won't you get me some rubber bands? And she said, I will not get them. And he said, I don't understand it. Uh, let me show you where they are. <laughs> and she has, still has her arms crossed and this frown on her face. And she follows him into the storeroom and he goes over to where the rubber bands are stored and he pulls them out and he goes, he says, these are rubber bands. And she goes, Oh, she said, I thought you were talking about something else. She said, where I come from, they call those gum bands. So, that was what happened to her one day. You want to say something? She was embarrassed, of course. Um, at some point in uh, the Metroplex, uh, you know, you, People go to rodeos, maybe, but uh, in that area, you know that the Fort Worth Rodeo is a really good rodeo. The Mesquite Rodeo is an excellent rodeo. But sometimes they have a rodeo at the State Fair of Texas. That's, it's just for show, pretty much, and it's really not a, all that great a rodeo as far as rodeos go. And like some other events in towns, you know, uh, businesses buy tickets for the rodeo to help fund it. And then they don't really want to go to the rodeo because it's not a good rodeo, so they give those tickets away to other people. You understand this system. It's not the first time this ever happened in the community. Um, and so one day my dad came home from work and he had these two tickets to the State Fair Rodeo and he said, he said, if you want to use these, you can have them. And I thought, well, what would I do with those? Everybody I know knows that that's not a very good rodeo. So I wouldn't want to ask Anybody go with me to that rodeo? So, one day it hit me. Mary Ann's never been to a rodeo. <laughs> she probably wouldn't know what to think about a rodeo. So one day I asked her, I said, would you want to go to a rodeo? And she said, <clears throat> and I can't do this properly. But she looked at me and she said, with you? <laughs> and as a guy, you know, when, when that feeling comes on, when you get that feeling and it hits right about here and it says, man, I wish I'd never asked her that question. <laughs> so I said yes with me and she said, well, okay. <laughs> so we went to the rodeo and we had a good time. We went to the, I mean, we rode some of the rides and did that kind of thing. And that's kind of what started our liking to be around each other more. And, um, so pretty soon, uh, we had to leave working there because we're not allowed to date people you're working with. Um, so that's where that happened. Mm, we both had 55-minute commutes 
to work. I was working for PepsiCo uh, at the time and for about six years, and I was doing work for them all over the country. So I, about 26 weeks of the year, I'd be going uh, on the road. And that was okay, you know, when you, you don't have any kids yet, that kind of thing, that was a, kind of okay. Um, but then Aaron was born, and then that wasn't okay. Because I'd find myself in, you know, Torrance, California or somewhere, wondering how much different she looks this week than, than last time I saw her. And they changed so quickly at that age, I didn't enjoy that anymore. So we started, um, I started figuring out we needed to maybe move to a smaller city, uh, the big city and the long commutes and all that. Neither of us were brave enough to live in the country, um, but we thought a smaller city. And, and there was a guy at church, we were going to church at Preston Crest, and um, there was a guy there that, um, came and asked me if I'd be interested to co come work for his um, banking firm in Lubbock. And so I des we decided to do that and moved out here. And I remember we were driving with all our stuff. Um, you know, and we got to, what's the name of that? Snyder? Not Snyder. No, it's, it's uh, Sweetwater. We got to Sweetwater. And there's that McDonald's there. It's still there. And um, I remember sitting in that McDonald's thinking about moving to Lubbock. And people, when they heard in, at church that we were moving to Lubbock, a number of them that I didn't know, you know, were from Lubbock, had gone to school here or something. And they all came up and said, you're love Lubbock, you know. And so we were thinking, that's good. And, but I remember thinking at that McDonald's, wow, I get the feeling I'm the only one going from Dallas to Lubbock. <laughs> and all these other cars going down the highway are going from Lubbock to Dallas. And, um, and that's okay. That's good. Yeah. Um, the first time we went, we came to Lubbock before we moved to look for a house to rent. We spent the whole day walking around. It seemed like with the realtor, and they all the houses look the same at some point. You know, you've seen them all, but, um, you know, all the houses that they had these wooden fences in the back, that was different. And uh, she told me that, you know, the, the trash is, in, you put your trash in the alley and dumpsters that you share. And um, I thought that's a little bit odd, but after you've seen about 800 houses, it seemed like, you know, I'd, I'd seen it all. So I thought, I think I'm gonna go look in the, at, in the alley and see the, and see the dumpster. <laughs> this was in mid-November. It was a windy day, a little bit cold. So I walked out the back, and opened the gate, and the wind was blowing a little bit, and, um, and she was walking behind me. And so when she got to the opening of the gate, she screamed. And I thought, what in the world could that be? And I turned around, and she said, what is that? <laughs> you wouldn't know you wouldn't know it by her level of her scream. Um, I said, "That's a tumbleweed," <laughs> and it was a it was a good size one. Too. It was just bumbling down the alley, and uh, and she said, "Well, we're in the West now," <laughs> and uh, we were, and we fell in love with Lubbock, and um, and that hadn't stopped. Um, the, the banking outfit I was working for uh, was, was savings and loan, and, and those places started having troubles in the late 80s, and that got to be a problem. So, so uh, um, we were thinking about, well, there's not a lot of jobs available to do something different, so I'm, we might have to leave back, go back to the major place to get a job, and I just didn't want to do that. There were a lot of jobs there. But we had fallen in love with Lubbock at that point. I didn't want to go. And I remember um, there was a Sunday, and Marianne was working in the nursery, and I was in the auditorium, and I, I, I went up to the balcony, which is a, um, a good place to go if you need to think. 
And I was sitting up there in one of those seats, there weren't many people around. I was just looking down at our congregation and I didn't want to leave Lubbock. I didn't want to leave Broadway. We love the, the, uh, the leadership here. We love the people here. And um, I didn't know what else, you know, I could get a job doing exactly um, in Lubbock. And I was thinking we're going to have to leave. And, and I started crying. Well, the balcony is a good place if that's what you got to do. I had to, to go do that with. So um, the next time I was going to Sunday school class, I was walking down the hallway over there on the second floor, and uh, Brent Majors came walking along, and he was on the board at the children's home at the time, and he said, he said, Brooks, he said, you know, the guy that does the, uh, the accounting work at the children's home has decided to retire, and uh, some of us were wondering if he might be interested in applying for that job. And that's how that happened. And so I'd found out by that time, by that point I'd, I'd met, known who Floyd Stumbo was and I was impressed with the children's home and, and the image and impression that, and uh, reputation that they have. And so that was 25 years ago. Um, so I guess it'd probably take. Um, Patrick was born here in, in Lubbock. Uh, he's, 29 now. Um, he's getting married in November. Um, let's see, back to I'll give you a little bit more um, things that have affected me uh, and how I think spiritually um, in recent years. Um, Romans 10 and 11 um, when I read those again, I don't remember that really being the feeling um, among people when I was growing up about their attitude toward um, Jewish people. But when you read Paul's description in Romans 10 and 11, uh, it wasn't like I perceived that people believed about that. Um, it seemed to be that most of the people I was around, I thought, sort of believed that, you know, we replaced the Jewish people as God's chosen people because they messed up. They got, their branches were cut off from the tree and we were grafted in, in their place. So much for them. But that's not what Paul says in Romans chapter 11. No. He said because of their disobedience, God stopped up their hearing, stopped up their ears, so they couldn't hear. And he blinded their eyes so they couldn't see so that they wouldn't understand. And that's why they didn't understand. And that's why they were resistant to the gospel. Remember he said he would give up, he would give up his future in heaven, his eternal life, if the people of Israel could be saved. Um, but God says that talking, talking about them, he says, when you find yourself in the far corners of the earth that I've banished you to and you remember me and how I've blessed your people in the land And you turn because you want to return to that. When you turn and your attitude turns toward me, you'll find that I'm there quickly because I'm not far from you. And I will restore you to me. And I'm going to restore you to much greater 
than you imagined that you could live like. And I will restore you to the land. And it goes on and on about how much he loves them and how much he wants to reward them <laughs> if they'll just turn back to him. Um, this gave me a very different view about what my attitude should be toward Jewish people. My attitude should be there as a brother, um, as an encourager, <coughs> as somebody who uh, is there to help them and bless them in some way. As I would, would as I would feel that way about other people, but after reading what Paul had to say, it really affected me. Um, I started attending uh, a Torah, men's Torah class in 2009 with Jack Dyer and eventually Becton and some other guys. And we kind of read through the first five books of, uh, of the Bible over a course of a year and discuss it each week. And so tonight, after the class that happens over here that I go to, I go to that one too. Um, it's powerful. So that's a big, big part of what I think is important. The other thing I think has affected me a lot during the last few years is on the, I serve on the missions committee. Um, I've traveled to uh, Nazareth uh, twice. And um, it's a different perspective on the world. Um, and you see the, the people that are living there, and the people we were working with were primarily Arab Christians. This last trip we were there, something I learned that I didn't know before. But I had known <coughs> Um, online, there, you know, you can go to this online website called imetmessiah.com and they have video testimonies by Jewish people who become believers in Christ. And so those are pretty interesting to watch. While we were there, we met with a, uh, an administrator of a Christian college in Nazareth. We were talking to him about ways we might be able to the church there might be able to work with him and, and uh, mutually benefit. One of the things he was telling us was about, was about the number of evangelical Christians, which is, of course, a kind of large term, but uh, the number of evangelical Christians in Israel, I think they have about 16 million people who live there in Israel. The number of evangelical Christians that live there would be 5,000. Do you know how many Messianic Jewish Christians there are in Israel? I had no idea. 15,000. Three times more than evangelical Christians. Most of them uh, worship in house churches in the Jerusalem area. That was interesting to me. Um, it's growing. That population is growing. It didn't, 10 years ago, there almost wasn't much of that there at all. So I've rambled on about that for too long. That's one of my failures that Mary Ann reminds me about. <laughs> so that's what I had to say. <laughs> One thing I do have to tell you about Brooks is his dad was his mentor, and he baptized Brooks, but he also baptized me. Um, I didn't get baptized until after Brooks and I started dating, but his father was a very big influence in both of our lives. And still is. Still he, is. He's 89, uh, kind of still making it. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions for either of us? We would entertain them. You skipped right over your marriage. You went from a date to Aaron. <laughs> well, Marianne, 
you know, I don't do things slow like he does. Yeah. Go ahead, you tell him about it. No? Okay. Some of you will be grossed out by this, and so I apologize. Never. <laughs> but, We got married at Preston Road Church of Christ in Dallas because they have a nice large um, foyer. There's a beautiful tile floor so we could have our reception there. We didn't have any money to get married, any funding. And so uh, she had a friend that made her dress in our class at church. Uh, some other people made the cake. Um, we got married for like $600, I think. Um, it was it was great, and we were so happy. I remember her mother came uh, uh, to the wedding, and and she said something very similar to Mary Ann's impression you heard a while ago. Afterwards, she said she said that music was the most beautiful that I'd ever heard. And Mary Ann said, "Did you know that there, there wasn't an organ, Mom?" <laughs> And her mom said, yeah, there was. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Pennsylvania thing, I guess. <laughs> anyway, when she was told it was just voices, she was amazed. Um, so, we got married. Good. Yeah, it was great. Mary Ann, was your family okay with you marrying someone who wasn't Catholic? No, they were not. That was a very difficult time. But they've come... Well, actually, Brooks's father went to Pittsburgh to meet my family. And when they met him, they realized that, you know, things weren't as bad as they thought. <laughs> and uh, then they met Brooks and fell in love with him like I did. And then they were good. But it was really hard. That was, that was the most difficult, probably two years. My brother's a priest. I have a brother who's a Catholic priest. And so it's still a little difficult for him at times, but not not because of Brooks or not because of me. It's just difficult that we don't follow their traditions. But he's very gracious to us. He's very, yeah. Yeah, we have a good relationship. Looking back, like, how do you, do you see times over God's providence in where he led you and where, what he led you to do or mm -hmm. places he brought you? Do you see him taking care of you mm -hmm. looking back? The children's home job yeah. thing, we didn't want to leave Lubbock and just, we were packing up, we were ready to go, we had to. Mm -hmm. And yes, he wanted us to stay. So we could be sitting here tonight <laughs> telling you our life story. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you work now? Pardon me? Where, Brooks, where do you work now? Children's home. Children's home. Yeah, I, I haven't changed titles or jobs. <laughs> I enjoyed a lot Great. and they've been pleased to have me so it's it's been a good deal. So in 25 years you haven't gotten a promotion? <laughs> That's great. I've neither sought one nor has one been offered. We did take I did we did take on the additional accounting work of the Texas Boys Ranch. Are you still using the same calculator? <laughs> no it wore out. I did change calculators. And, that one of the first things I did when I walked in was I said, well, I need a computer, you know. And so Floyd was stunned. But, uh, you know, they did me a computer. And so it started going from there pretty well. We had, interestingly, if we didn't even do any accounting work, when I got there in April, no, May, when I got there, April or May, the prior thing that they had had crashed in December. And so no transactions had been posted from December forward. And so I had to uh, begin the process of uh, setting up a general ledger, getting account numbers, and posting those account numbers to all those transaction documentation items that we had for all that time. And then begin, we got a new computer system at the same, in May, and we started posting all those things on the, on the system. Because we hadn't closed the prior year yet. And uh, so we were doing that at the same time, trying to do accounting for the current things that were going on. I had one assistant. And um, in September, uh, working a lot of hours in September, we got caught up to where we were no longer posting old transactions. We were just starting to post new transactions. And uh, that was really good. 
Kind of like digging through a shoebox? <laughs> Worse. <laughs> it was like the man with the shoebox came every yeah. day. I'm I'm a like Judy Linker said we rock babies. <laughs> I'm in the nursery um, every Sunday. That's I, it's my highlight of the week. Those babies love me. They don't care if my hair doesn't look good. They don't care if I have bad breath. They just come and hug me, and I love that. And it's cold in here, Rodney, so the babies keep me warm. <laughs> Do y'all not agree that it's cold all the time in the church building? <laughs> See, Rodney's not just me. <laughs> that's what I do, and that's what I love. I really do. The nursery is my favorite part of Sunday school. Any more? Tick tock, tick tock. <laughs> okay. I have a question for you. Um, actually, it's two. Uh, you, you kind of mentioned being at Broadway, but you guys didn't tell us about how you got here. So I was curious, what, what brought you to Broadway, but also looking in the future, what excites you about where we're going and is keeping you here at Broadway? We visited uh, one church, I think we visited at Monterey. Um, Several. Two or three, maybe. <laughs> I thought it was just one other one, but we visited at Broadway, and we, we just liked it immediately better than any other ones. Uh, Ken Dye was preaching then. We really didn't, no offense to him, but you know, the preacher wasn't the reason we loved Broadway. We loved Broadway because of the leaders that were here at the time and the people that were here at the time. Uh, Bart Succi was instantaneously uh, hospitable to uh, us and to Marianne in particular. And uh, there were other people that were just friendly to us, and we felt at home here from the outset. We never visited anywhere else, mm -hmm. never wanted to go anywhere else. Um, did you have another question? Yeah. So what's something that excites you about Broadway and what's going on right now and where we're headed? <sighs> Man, um, <laughs> there's a lot. But one of them is this idea coming up, uh, this this idea about the way we're going to think about what we're going to be doing and it's we're going to be pursuing God and we're going to be building community and this last one's the best one just the combination of these words is good we're going to be unleashing compassion and that's what the children's home does we build community with children that have been in danger and uh, in really bad places. And uh, we build community with the staff, too, and uh, provide sanctuary for people. And we unleash compassion. And that's one of the most fun things for an accountant to get in the car at the end of the day and not go home from doing an audit at PepsiCo or something, but uh, go home and know that even my accounting work did something good for hurting children today. It makes me feel good. So Broadway is going to be building community and unleashing compassion. And this is going to be the way we're going to focus on things and the way we're going to make some choices as to what we do. It's going to be focused on this approach. And that's very exciting to me. Can we thank Brooks and Marion? I'll ask Rodney to go ahead and make his way up here to say a closing prayer uh, over you guys. One of the things that uh, struck me when we moved to Lubbock from Austin, uh, Brooks and Marion were some of the first to just kind of wrap their arms around us. And I remember very specifically Marion talking with Gabe having this conversation about the Longhorns <laughs> and football and just drawing him in and his face in our conversations after that uh, it was a really sweet thing if you have a baby or have had a baby at this church they have been loved on by Marion and so I, it's 
it's so sweet to know that my kids aren't the only ones that have been loved on, but all of our kids have been loved on. And Brooks and Mary have been a steady force here, and we're so thankful for you guys. Thanks for sharing with us. Uh, Rodney, would you offer a word of blessing and thanks to God for them? And Brooks and Mary Ann are some of the just really special people that I, I know here. Um, Mary Ann makes me laugh and then sometimes makes me cry. Um, Brooks makes me scratch my head a lot. <laughs> but Brooks has a passion and a compassion. If Brooks gets something in his head and he's decided he's going to do it, you can just take that to the bank. Uh, ask him sometime about his cell phone. <laughs> Brooks doesn't have a cell phone. <laughs> you know how frustrating that is for him. <laughs> <laughs> ask John Crump. Oh, yeah. His defined is freedom. <laughs> Amen. He does have a watch, and there's a story that John Crumpler can tell you about that watch. And that's a, a new thing. For Brooks. Was number three. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the laughter that you give to us. And Lord, I thank you for people that you bring into our lives that draw us into laughter. Because I know, Lord, you created laughter. And I, I thank you for that. But I also want to thank you especially for Brooks and Mary Ann who not only make us laugh, but make our hearts burn with a deep passion. They passionately love your church. They passionately love children. Lord, their hearts just burn brightly with that love. I thank you that you have brought them on that journey that has brought them to this place and this time and among these people. You have blessed us enormously. Lord, I ask that you would especially bless Patrick as he prepares for his marriage. Lord, bless that marriage. What a great example he has in his grandparents and his parents and so many other people that they are <coughs> friends with. Lord, I ask that you would bless Aaron you would fill her with your love each and every day. We thank you for these wonderful children that are their biological children, but they have so many others. Lord, just continue to use them powerfully in your kingdom. Let their spirits soar and bless their household all the days of their life as they have chosen to follow you. We pray these things in the most holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.